Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Ryan Grimm. He is the uh, Washington Bureau Chief uh, for The Intercept, also one of the co-hosts on uh, Counterpoint, and author of, I believe now, three books. And yes. the third is The Squad, AOC and the Hope of a Political Revolution, which is part of a trilogy are we going to see a trilogy from this or it's a two-part <laughs> theory i remember your first one be. was on drugs it was about drugs right yeah so that that can't really be necessarily part of the trilogy um, no that's the hobbit right that's a <laughs> the, the hobbit exactly <laughs> yeah I, I i mean i wouldn't put a cap at it maybe it'll be even more but it's up to your audience if they buy the book then publishers will let me continue to write books and publish them. So well, and that doesn't be more dictate and more what and your more. subject's going to be, though. I'm not saying I said trilogy. Yeah, so far as like your it. last one was about we we've got uh, people, right. which was about the birth of like the uh, the the sort of this progressive resurgence within right. the Democratic uh, party, and then uh, the squad is about like you know the hiccups and the the the, right. the the start of that and uh you know that's that's that was my point but let's not know exactly and you know the next the next one would you know continue to tell uh the story but as you guys know from the world of streaming uh they, they will cancel a show on a cliffhanger you know if, if they feel like it they don't they don't care well let's hope uh, part three um, is like you know them actually i don't know someone one of them becoming president or something like that because i don't know how much more i can take of uh of what's going on with Biden right now. <laughs> it's, it's a little rough to have him as the head of the Democratic Party at the moment. Let's sure um, <laughs> let's start with this clip of you, actually. You were at the, um, I, I don't know, uh, is this at, uh, I guess, at the White House State, in the no, press State pool? Department. State Department yeah. press pool talking to uh, State Department spokesperson Mark Miller about the... Um, uh, about the basically the broad question, uh, South Africa is taking uh, Israel to the International Court of Justice with charges of genocide. Emma uh, interviewed a um, a human rights lawyer yesterday who's won in front of uh, Francis Boyle. You may have seen um, I don't know, his mm -hmm. recent appearance on Democracy Now, where he mm -hmm. said something similar, where he believes, based on his uh, reading of of. Uh, the case put forward by South Africa, he says it's very well researched and thorough, and he believes that within the next week or so that Israel will be found to have been or will lose their case um, and that they'll have to the United Nations may have to move forward with them uh, uh, having committed crimes of genocide. And I was we'll I was that. on democracy now right after him, so I captively watched the, that interview. I had no choice. But it was a very good interview. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's Emma great. did an uh, even better job yesterday. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no doubt. No doubt um, she did. All right. But let's look at uh, your question of uh, Miller. And to follow up on Turkey, I'm sure you've seen Turkey has joined South Africa in its uh, charging Israel with genocide before the International Court of Justice. Is there any concern within the State Department that State Department officials could be? roped in to this this prosecution uh no i will say that that uh as it relates to the state department we have been committed to addressing the humanitarian situation uh in gaza and have made a priority of preventing as we i just said in your in response to your question the displacement of palestinians um i will also say though that genocide is of course a heinous atrocity um one of the most heinous atrocities that any individual can commit uh, those are allegations that should not ma be made lightly. And as it, it pertains to the United States, we are not seeing any acts that constitute genocide. And, and finally, over the break, uh, top authorities in the Armenian quarter expressed deep concern uh, that the Israeli government was using the conflict in Gaza to push out a lot of Armenian Christians from the Armenian court, uh, quarter. Any uh, response? So no specific response to that, but as we have said um, on a, a number of occasions, um, we do not want to see the government of Israel take any steps that would uh, escalate tensions. So, go ahead. Now, I notice he doesn't follow up that with, and if we do, or now that we are, um, there's nothing else after that. It is... Um, and, you know, it, it's quite clear that we have not exercised any leverage whatsoever. So we can't test the theory as to whether uh, the U.S. could influence uh, Israel with its, you know, 
to actually not do the things that we supposedly want them not to do. I'm, uh, I, you know, I increasingly it's harder to accept that we don't want them to do this really mm -hmm. in, in with any type of uh, energy if we're not going to do anything about it. but And nor have they conducted, and this is, I think, your question sparked this political report, mm -hmm. if I were to be, if I were to guess, uh, Ryan, that the yeah. U.S. has not formally assessed if Israel is violating human human rights. So that's an admission in Politico right. that even though they say they're not committing genocide, they've done zero formal review of it. That's right, yeah. That, after that question, there were no, a number of other reporters who picked up on kind of some newsworthy nuggets that he dropped there as you pointed out to follow up on well wait a minute you've determined that there's no act so that that means there was a process that led to a determination can you tell us about that process and event right and eventually it got to that point but yeah the it, i thought his answer was interesting because it's like okay what's your culpability you know what's your exposure in this war crimes prosecution and the answer was we have told them not you know to take care of the humanitarian situation and to do everything you can uh, to reduce civilian casualties. So like, therefore, you know, we are not exposed. Like that, that was basically his answer. But if, if you think about it in a more common sense kind of way, it's like, all right, somebody comes to you and they're like, hey, I'm gonna go rob this 7-Eleven. Can I have a gun? You know, like, you should not rob that 7-Eleven. That would be inappropriate. Uh, but yeah, here's the gun. Right. And then they go in, they rob the 7-Eleven, they shoot the clerk, they come back out, and they're like, I'm going to go rob another 7-Eleven, but I'm out of bullets. Like, well, I really think it's a bad idea to rob the second 7-Eleven. Like, you should definitely not do that. It, we don't want to see or, it. <laughs> or and take, take care next time to, like, just rob the till. You don't have to shoot the clerk. And they're like, you know, I actually, I think we're going to shoot the clerk. So can I have some bullets? And you're like, here are some bullets, but do not do this. Like, it's a really bad idea. We really would encourage you not to do this. And then they go in and rob the second 7-Eleven and kill that clerk, too. It doesn't seem to me like if that person gets arrested that the person would get off. Like, just sitting in the back seat of a car when you don't even know the guy is going to rob a 7-Eleven has people sitting in prison today but like actually handing them the bullets and the gun to do it. I don't think you get out of jail just by suggesting that they, you know, act a little more responsibly if they keep coming back for more and continue to not act responsibly. Do you think uh, Miller's response that this is not something to be uh, accused or make the accusation lightly or frivolously, do you think that that is the nascent effort to begin to delegitimize the result of this um uh, uh tribunal i guess uh case in the event that it does come back like yeah there is um an attempted genocide going on or a genocide or yeah. ethnic cleansing or or, or or something that is um you know sort of a, a substantial charge that I, I think sort of like validates what people are seeing with their own eyes. I think they're going to throw a lot against the wall between now and, and a verdict. Uh, and you're seeing Kirby do it a little differently. And I thought it was interesting, the daylight between Miller's response and later in the, in the press briefing, Miller said the uh, a reporter asked, well, what do you think of South Africa? Have you talked to them about, what do you think of the fact that they per pursued these charges? And he said, well, we don't think it's a productive step. Uh, and left it at that. Kirby, meanwhile, is like just, you know, furious, like, mm -hmm. you know, this is meritless. It's baseless. It's without any basis. In fact, it's slanderous. It's, you know, it's like he's like he's doing the like aggressive, like full on rebuttal to it. So I, it feels like there's a lot of different kind of responses that are being tested out. But it it is a real risk, as Emma, you know, from your interview uh, with Francis, like certainly, it's not it's not a totally toothless. Um, I would argue. I, I would argue it's it's uh, not just not totally. I mean, well, it's not totally toothless in terms of like the culpability, right? As you say, I wish it had more teeth. But in terms of the cases being presented by South Africa, hundreds of footnotes, um, the uh, the cases laid out quite clearly. And uh, when I spoke to, to Francis yesterday, he went through the different um, 
planks of what constitutes genocide in international law and also use his experience in arguing on behalf of victims of genocide in order to frame the, the conversation and said how Israel exceeds many of uh, what he successfully argued in front of the ICJ in terms of their crimes and death tolls and maiming in stated intent, as well as the case that's being brought by South Africa is much more robust than what he said even he was able to present during his time, um, I think it was with Bosnia, in his case in front of the ICJ, because it has more uh, people working on it, and the footnotes and the evidence and the stated intent by Israeli officials in public, blatantly, is so obvious that, like, in, in, it, it, we'll see how the process plays out, but um, the United States is in some scary territory here, and I think it really bore... Uh, exemplifies the arrogance of uh, kind of an old guard of people in the foreign policy apparatus that see the United States uh, hegemonic role in the world as immutable and as unchanging because of like the the uh, because of American might and how um, they're really underestimating, I would say, how quickly the world is turning on the United States and Israel, even though it's borne out in just like the numbers in the United Nations. Right. And wh where do they think that this goes afterwards? Uh, they keep talking about, you know, the day after for Gaza. Uh, and fr from that perspective, it seems to be only the Israeli government that that has a real plan for the day after for Gaza, the, a, a plan that the kind of U.S. policymakers keep pretending is is not their plan. Uh, but what about the day after, you know, for Israel? Uh, there was actually a piece in on Haaretz this morning talking about how the Israeli public is living in a, a kind of fantasy land constructed by Channel 12 and the, and the IDF propaganda that is keeping them from having any idea of what's actually going on on the ground in Gaza and also having any idea about what's going on uh, in in the rest of the world as it relates to public opinion about what Israel is doing. And so, and their argument is that at, at, at the at the day after, Israel is going to be extremely isolated uh, and in, in a difficult uh, political situ geopolitical situation, which will be made worse when there is, if there is a, an international court of justice uh, verdict that people can point to because the entire effort to uh, undermine the BDS movement by you know, calling it anti-Semitic and a double standard is really under is really you know blown apart by a, a verdict that you could point to at an, at the ICJ. I, I think this is a point that people need to really understand. Gideon Levy, uh, the, the sort of famed Israeli uh, journalist, has, has said the same thing. He said like the Israeli population has absolutely no idea what's going on in Gaza. Mm -hmm. They're completely uh, and. Um, in a moment, maybe we'll play this clip of uh, that uh, I saw on your Twitter feed of um, of some students, uh, essentially, I mean, not attacking their principal, but um, you know, uh, uh, I, I, like chastising their principal for for introducing mm -hmm. the idea of what is going on in Gaza. But this is, I mean, people should understand this, and this is frankly something that I had predicted, I don't know, ten years ago. That we're going to get to a point where Israel is going to become increasingly uh, isolated, and Biden is, it seems to me, at least within the Democratic Party, but possibly across American politics, the high water mark in terms of uh, completely unconditioned support for Israel, mm -hmm. and it also seems unsustainable to me when the Biden administration had uh, issued an assessment of the Russian war crimes within. Literally like four weeks, I think, of its invasion of Ukraine. And now, two months into this, um, three months into this now, has made no assessment. You don't, they don't want to see what's there. Eventually, this assessment is going to have to be made. It may be accelerated by this, this, this court uh, case. But um, this, we are at the high watermark, it seems to me, of support for Israel. Mm -hmm. And... There is no way that it is going to increase from here because even if this was to end tomorrow, it there we're never going to get to this level where people can justify what's gone on more. But as we start to see what's under the rubble, as 
in the event that this becomes even more, uh, you know, involving Lebanon or uh, we assassinate somebody in Iraq, uh, the the attack in Syria, uh, Israel's attack in, in Beirut. I mean, this is it can only get worse for here from here from Israel. But look at this, this is a, uh, something you had posted. Um, Yala, I think, is the name of the uh, principal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they are yelling, Yala, go home. This is a principal. And, and like throwing stuff at her. Throwing stuff at her. She was suspended for publishing a message in support of Gazan children. That's it. And then we can talk a little bit more about the, the, the media censorship there uh, and social media uh, re repercussions. And here are the children yelling at her, uh, go home in this school. See like a water balloon or something falls yeah. through. Yeah, the kids see uh... But all these kids are tormenting their their principal uh, for raising the specter of the over 10,000 um, now reportedly children in Gaza who have died. We had a caller the other day who said she has a, who's from the West Bank, who has a friend who's um, in, in Gaza, who, who the doctor is saying that, that children are having heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Young children are having heart attacks because they're in such a state, they're not getting sleep, they're in such a state of, of fear that literally kids are now, ha cardiac arrest is a thing amongst children there. Um, let's talk about this dynamic, though, in Israel, when we talk about the bubble that the Israeli population yeah. is in. Because, again, the 80% of them, th this is a rough number, 80% want Netanyahu gone. But only after that 80% want Gaza leveled. And right. it is much easier to maintain support for this type of uh, thing where you don't have to witness the implications of it. But, but talk a little bit both about the um, censorship that is happening in terms of the media and also that people don't understand this. You can get arrested for posting stuff on social media in Israel that is in any way sympathetic to uh, Palestinians. Yeah, I think it's uh, there was a, I mean, th there have been some serious censorship laws in place before October 7th. But after October 7th, they amended, I think it's Title 42 of the. Uh, Israeli code that involves counterterrorism that says that not just posting, but even consuming certain media uh, is a, is a criminal offense. Scroll scrolling, uh, landing on, um, let, let's say, like Hamas puts out a video of some like attack in you know inside mm -hmm. Gaza. Uh, but it's not just Hamas. Like they, they're the uh, IDF is free to designate any other sources that they consider to be, you know, supportive of of terrorism. And so the definition is just extremely broad um, about you know not just about what you're able to say, but what you're able mm -hmm. to read. Uh, there was a there was this harrowing video that came out in the early stages of this with the um, Israeli Israeli Arab woman getting confronted by police. Yeah. Um, because she had posted uh, something like, you know, may God, may God protect them. And you can see in her face that immediately um, she realizes what's going on. And she's like, no, 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 no. I'm talking about may God protect the Israeli soldiers who are, she's begging, you know, who are going into yeah. Gaza. Like I am on, I am on your side. I'm an Israeli mm -hmm. citizen. I like, no, no, no. Like she's, but she can see her life flashing before her eyes because if she gets pulled into this Kafka-esque kind of system, there may be no getting out of it, or you, she may spend years in it. When when she, she, it it seemed genuine and authentic that like what she was saying was "May God protect the Israeli soldiers." Aside from all that, then it was her WhatsApp status message, like it wasn't even like a, a tweet. Post. It's like right, yeah. So, and so putting us setting aside the fact of whether. That let's say she was talking about Palestinian civilians. May God protect them. Like that actually would have been straight up criminal. 
Like you could not say, mm -hmm. may God protect Palestinian civilians. The, like you, people think about the fact that the principal was suspended from her job for posting uh, sympathy for Palestinian children who were being killed. Not, not for defending like the right to resist the oppressor or saying anything positive about any Palestinian militant or terrorist or anything like that, just for expressing sympathy for Palestinian children. She was, she was suspended from her job, could have been arrested. And, you know, th there's a warning that, you know, you're oftentimes if you're, if you're a Jewish Israeli on your first offense, you're not going to go to prison for it, um, though you could. Um, but there's a, you know, if she continues to post sympathy for, uh, for Palestinian children that, that could happen but then she comes back to school after the suspension and is just greeted with this you know jeering mob of, of other children which I, I mean there's there's two different stories there one is I think people aren't aware of and we, we I think we played a clip from uh, uh, a Israeli history teacher who was on democracy now I think maybe about a month ago yeah um, he was arrested and uh, interrogated multiple times. His name was Meyer Baruchin. Um, mm -hmm. After he posted a message on Facebook about his opposition to the killing of innocent Palestinian civilians. And so you have this chilling effect where you get arrested if you do, even if you say, I don't think we should be killing people. And then to look at the, the, the mob of children who have obviously been sort of like marinated in this uh, culture that is in this bubble where the idea that their teacher expressed sympathy for Palestinian children was enough to get her sort of booed and water ballooned and whatnot. I mean, you know, what they did, you know, this is a grown woman, she can handle it, but it is yeah. indicative of what is going on and just how sort of like isolated the Israeli population is. I think it remains to be seen whether they will ever really get a full gist of what's gone on there and whether that would make a difference. Frankly, I don't know, but it ain't going to get any better. Uh, let's put it that way. It really is um, astonishing. And the Biden administration, it seems to me, has no interest. I mean, they can say, well, we've got to be this way with Netanyahu because look at who's in his 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 administration. You know, this is Netanyahu's the best that we're going to find in that uh, that government. And look at the Israeli population. But but there is a part of the reason why the Israeli population is not questioning any of this is because the president of the United States, and this is not the typical response of the president of the United States, is not giving any indication that there's mm. any problem whatsoever. And if Joe Biden was out there calling for a ceasefire, if Joe Biden was out there saying, we're not going to do aid because they're not listening to me, um, the Israeli population, it would start to mean something to the Israeli population. That's the way it used to work in the previous mm -hmm. decades. And, and speech and press laws can have a major effect. Like that's a reason that governments, you know, institute them a lot, you know, a lot for a lot of people, because the laws are in place now, they're not actually they're not seeing images of uh, Palestinian children being blown up. They're just not they're just not seeing them. Uh, they're not hearing that their neighbors have some creeping doubts about what the Israeli government is doing. And so it it becomes very easy then, you know, if you t if you took the the climate in America of post 9-11, Right. where everybody was self-censoring already because they were in absolute <laughs> bloodlust and rage. And then you layered on top of that a propaganda law that said you are only allowed to support war. Then it would have, the, the period of time where we were in this like red hot rage would have, you know, we would have been in a red hotter rage and yep. it would have last and it would have lasted longer. Yep. And, and you're 100%. the, the, I just want to point out too, the intercept had a great um, piece yesterday um, I believe it, it was written by Daniel uh, Bogoslaw about CNN in the United States um, and the Middle Eastern uh, when reporting is coming out of the Middle East covering this conflict in particular it also goes through the Israeli government censors 
Right. Yes. Yeah. So, right. What he what he discovered is, and there's some internal dissent about this practice inside of CNN that they've uh, it, that they insist that all uh, reporting about the war be routed through the Jerusalem Bureau, which does then imp implicate the IDF censor. Um, so, uh, but it also, you know, it, as um, uh, all news organizations work this way, the Jerusalem Bureau those reporters are going to be closest to the Israeli government. That's how that type of access journalism works. Um, and so th there, there's going to be a certain lens that is then applied to pieces that are then pushed through there, even before you get to the um, IDF sensor. I, I want to make this, I, I want to make this uh, explicit for people. So they understand this dynamic by routing these stories through the Jerusalem uh, Bureau the Jerusalem Bureau, putting aside any contact they have in that moment with the Israeli government, their careers, their ability to do their work is based upon relationships that they've made in Israel. If, the, if it is known outside of the CNN structure that the J Jerusalem Bureau has veto power on stories that get on uh, CNN, that is a problem for them theoretically with their uh with the israeli officials that they want to get information from uh it may also be an advantage to them that they can get more information from but they have to deliver mm -hmm. the veto uh, on some things and it's highly problematic it seems to me um yeah. but you know uh i of all the the networks that doesn't surprise me uh based upon you know wolf blitzer's uh um history and um, some of, uh, Jake Tapper's, uh, perspective on this, but all right, be that as it may, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the, this is, w there's a real danger that this is going to widen. We've been uh, talking about this for a couple months and that we're, we're seeing stuff like, um, uh, engagement with the Houthis, um, assassinations or killings in, in Syria and, and, and in Iraq, and um, uh, Israeli uh, drone strikes in Beirut. Um, it really does feel like Israel would love to have a conflict in, with Lebanon at this point because Netanyahu wants this to go on forever. But how could Biden, from a political standpoint, and it, it seems like he's just literally like hell bent, like there's nothing besides trains, nothing's more important to him <laughs> than doing whatever uh, Israel says. But at one point, doesn't someone say, this is going to politically cost you? And um, it, it, because it clearly is going to cost. It's just a question of how much. And uh, like, what is going on there? Do you have any sense? Are there are people starting to freak out about this? In they, the way they are. And they are uh, in, inside the State Department, inside the White House. Uh, it, it, it feels to people that it's just ideological uh, for for Biden at, at this point, uh, that he's willing to continue down this path despite the clear political costs that it has to him, <laughs> despite the fact that it is his political opponents, Netanyahu would like nothing more than to see Trump, Biden lose, yep. um, that are, that are dealing him these costs and all, but also Netanyahu, I think should be careful what he wishes for. There's nobody more cynical in politics than Trump, like tr Trump is not doing a damn thing for Israel that hurts him or right. any Trump's not doing anything for anybody. It's not, Israel's not special in that case. If, if he thinks it would remotely cost him politically, the second that Israel becomes anything of a drag to him, he would pivot and, and dump them as quickly as he, as he aligned, aligned with them. He, you know, if he thought it was politically advantageous to, uh, have Kim Jong Un as his like vice president, he'd do it. He he right. does, he absolutely he, just does right, not care right, about anything. Right, right. And so the point being that, um, despite the fact that, like you know, at one point, you know, I think the Abram Accords, I think uh, moving the um, embassy to Jerusalem, these were all basically table settings to allow the uh, Israelis to have this type of hubris, frankly. Right. Um, and to expect which, which got us where we are, uh, without a doubt, in my mind. Uh, but. Um, if Trump saw numbers that suggested, and right now I think it's like 49% of uh, Republicans are saying ceasefire, they are probably 
um, the softest right. Trump Trump supporters in the Republican Party. But if that was to flip, um, he would call for a ceasefire tomorrow. And um, I wouldn't put it past him to be like, I I'll fix this problem. I'll end this war. Right. Um, well, all right. But let's uh, let's talk about. I mean, um, uh, let's just Biden. They are planning to impeach maybe Mayorkas. In a couple of weeks, they're going to have two votes to waste. Once, like, McCarthy's gone, <laughs> and uh, I can't remember who the other one was going to become president of. Uh, I can't remember who it is, but he's gone in, in, a, in like, I think a week and a half. They're going to have two votes to waste. They're going to have a three-vote margin. Tie gets you nowhere in the House. There's no tie-breaking uh, uh, right. situation. And by mid-February, there's going to be an election for George Santos's seat. And uh, that could swing right. towards the Democrats. Swazi could win there. What are they going to do when they can't, when they go down the road to impeach Biden, and then they can't even impeach him in the House? Um, like, what's Mark Molinaro going to vote for? What's like... You know, uh, what's his face from California? You know, there's a couple of, uh, of Republicans who it seems can't afford to go down there. And now the more they investigate, the more dirt they find on Trump. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, they're a very day at a time caucus. <laughs> so they will cross that bridge, you know, if and when they get to it. You saw how that worked out for Kevin McCarthy, like his whole strategy for becoming speaker and staying speaker was a day at a time. And it lasted, he, he made it what, nine months or something like that. Um, and so he got, he gets uh, a Wikipedia page for speakers of the house. And he can take that kind of wooden, that oak thing with his name etched in it and put it on his wall. Uh, but that's, that's it. Um, they, they don't, they, they don't seem to have a strategy. Uh, but the, if the impeachment is to try to make um, Steve Bannon and his base happy, they'll, they can put it on the floor. The moderate Republicans can vote against it. Steve Bannon can then be angry at the moderate Republicans. But Steve Bannon is also pretty savvy. And so he'll eventually tell his crowd to move on to something else because what's the point of you know, real, wasting all of your time going after these uh, Republicans who are now running in swing districts, you know, they'll find something else shiny to go after. Uh, so yeah, I think it's just a, a day at a time thing. And maybe you punt the impeachment vote as far as you can and, and hope that people forget about it. Like th their strategy seems to be just surviving and hoping people forget about what they're, what they're, what they promised. Are they, is, is Mike Johnson right now preparing to do, um, like, uh, uh, something that he hopes people forget about in terms of like the continuing resolution. I mean, this is the thing, the other thing that's coming up. What, what well, he, like he's a, also, he's also going to have a bad spend, a bad government spending deal to try to get through uh, because, you know, he's negotiating with Schumer and, you know, some of this was already baked in freedom causes caucus is going to be mad about whatever deal they come up with. Now they want to shut the government down over the border. Uh, and so, that never, none of it ever ends well for Republicans and always ends with a stain on whoever the speaker, Republican speaker's face is. And so he's got to give in that context, he's got to give them something. So I was like, all right, here's your, here's your Mayorkas and Biden impeachment votes. Take these because he doesn't have anything to give them for the most part. Like that, that's it within his power to do other than shutdowns and impeachment votes. Is Schumer not giving him a bunch of stuff on immigration? I mean, it's it feels like the Democrats are getting uh, are going in and getting ready to, you know, um, mm -hmm. give away a lot of stuff in terms of like uh, immigrants and, and sort of, uh, I don't know, provide uh, more draconian border policies or whatnot. I mean, what is yeah, and, do you have any sense of that? Yeah. And Johnson is saying that he's going to also try to negotiate directly with the white house over this, but it's a real, you know, don't throw me in the briar patch situation. I think for Democrats who are just, you know, they don't have any ideological commitment to, uh, like decent immigration policies. It's, you know, the, the situation, at the border is causing them political harm. Uh, they're losing share with, uh, uh, Hispanics, even as, you know, Trump is the head of the Republican Party. So 
they they are kind of abandoning their whole kind of soft on immigration rhetoric that they've adopted over the last you know five six years so i think they actually are happy to have republicans force their hand and do some type of crackdown at the border you know, uh, right. that means that uh, Fox News will never call Biden soft on immigration again. Yes, exactly. And problem solved. Right. It, yeah. I, I, yeah. As long as the objective conditions change, then, of course, then it, it's just will be fine. crazy because this is uh, honestly, this is a really old trap that Democrats fell into with something like abortion, too, where we're not even going to say the word like, let's not say the word. And how does that work out? You leave a vacuum and the right completely dominates the conversation. And you see polling numbers, we've covered this on the show, when you ask questions about immigration, there's general confusion about what our policy even is and what a path forward would be. And that's directly the result of Democrats basically leaving the entire conversation to the Republicans to frame it in a certain way. And instead of thinking in a more structural, forward-thinking way, the Biden administration is just caving to what that framing is. Um, and he will get not he will get zero political points for it. Zero. None. Yeah, that, I think that's probably right. But um, they also don't care. They're like they they Democrats are fine with cracking down on the border, I think. Yeah. Like, but just speaking out as, as a political matter, if they're out there, they're, they're going to get caught with this Mayorkas impeachment, aren't they? Because if they're out there saying, yes, we need to crack down more on the border, well, then who do you blame for that? Right? Well, You've got they, to blame, they blame Mayorkas. Like, how many can... votes are the, 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 uh, the Republicans going to get to impeach Mayorkas? Maybe, maybe the issue of there being only a two-person uh, um, uh, majority for the Republicans or a three-person majority for Republicans is not going to be an issue. Because if the, Republic, if the Democrats are going to, um, if they're going to cave on this, that means that they're not going to be able to provide any type of sort of, never mind, direct defense from Mayorkas. They're not going to be able to put out any ideas in which to make the Mayorkas um, impeachment look like, uh, you know, some type of fanatical uh, craziness by the Republicans. Some of them are going to have to vote for it. Well, the idea that they can put forward, I don't think any of them will. We'll see. Um, the idea that they can put forward is that the laws haven't been updated since the 1980s. The laws are broken. It's not Mayorkas's fault that Congress has refused to give him a rational immigration system to, to execute, to implement. Uh, and then that'll be the justification for some crackdowns and some, and some new laws that, that they may, may or may not get through. Because it, Republicans also have no interest in solving the, the situation. Like, right. They would rather it, it stay in the news and you have constant video of, of people coming across the border and you have Democratic mayors complaining publicly about the migrant crisis, refugee crisis in their in their cities like they, they don't have any incentive like to solve to actually make the world better, particularly if there's a Democrat in the White House like to them, you know, uh, they'd rather have the crisis. So All that's right. why I think it might not happen. Um, interesting. We'll see, I guess. Um, all right. One more thing I want to talk to you about. Uh, you've been covering this uh, story of Imran Khan in, in Pakistan. Uh, do we have that clip? Yeah. Um, let's play this clip. Um, Wait for the end. You guys are going to love it. Okay. Um, and, and folks go, I think you interviewed Imran Khan in, in November, was it? Uh, I, think, I, think Ju I think June uh, for Deconstructed and uh, Counterpoints, yeah. June? Oh, God. Yeah, because he, he was in jail by July or August. Right. And the, you, you hadn't interviewed him after that. Oh, my God. Right. That was a long time ago. Uh, it felt like it was a month ago. I like to be one month <laughs> behind, and I didn't realize I was six. But here is uh, here you are uh, again. Is this that same day uh, where you were at the State Department, or this uh, different day? Different day. Okay, uh, Matt Miller again on the different uh, different tie. Different tie. Ooh. Ryan, go ahead. Follow up quickly on the question earlier about Pakistani elections. Yeah, you said 
It is for the Pakistani people to choose their government. And not only, as he mentioned, is uh, the former prime minister in jail at the time, but you're also seeing something rather extraordinary where members of his party who are filing to run for office, and there's a lot of video evidence from around the country that you, you may have seen this, they're filing to run for office and they're being arrested and abducted at the at the filing office. They're also arresting the quote unquote approvers, people who signed their petitions as well. So you're not going to have any candidates for the people to choose from. So how can Pakistani people choose their government if there's nobody to choose from on, on the ballot? And is this something uh, that is concerning? So I will say, without commenting on that, the, the specific matters, we want to see um, free and fair elections that are conducted in accordance with Pakistan's laws. It's not for the United States to dictate to, to Pakistan um, uh, how it conducts, the spe exact specifics of how it conducts its election, um, but to make clear that we want to see those elections conducted in a free, fair, and peaceful manner that includes freedom of expression, peaceful assembly and association, uh, and ultimately a full, uh, open, reliable, vibrant democratic process. But it feels like election rigging of this level would merit sanctions if any other, if a Maduro-like government did something like this, it would seem like uh, the State Department might come down a little harder. This is 250 million person democracy. Uh, and we will continue to support uh, democratic expression and uh, a vibrant democracy in Pakistan, but I don't have anything to preview from here. And you just said you will continue to support democratic suppression. Is that I said expression. Oh, expression. expression. Mm. You didn't, but... Uh. Well, also, what is democratic e expression? Like, I mean, I you know, I sort of get that, but I've never. Art earlier, pieces. he said. Earlier, he said freedom of expression, um, but democratic expression. I know what democratic suppression is. Democratic expression is aspirational. Mm -hmm. Aspirational, and they want it's, people to really want uh, democracy. There, um, it's, it's, this it's is expressing the like the idea of democracy by having a thing that they call an election, even if there aren't candidates on the ballot, but you go and you check a box there. It really feels like, uh, Joe Biden's foreign policy. And this was supposedly his thing, right? <laughs> I mean, this is why Obama chose him. He had been on the Senate foreign relations committee for like 50 years or something. That That's an exaggeration, yeah. but not a huge no, one, but not much. Um, and it really feels like th that the U.S. is completely rudderless here. I mean, do you yes. get that sense? I mean, yes. we're not I mean, like we thing... have no like stake in what's happening in in, in Pakistan. Like this is well, a... we, well, there unfortunately there was a rudder in Pakistan, and as we reported, like the the U.S. Uh, urged the military to oust Imran Khan. Mm -hmm because Imran Khan was neutral in the in the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, and now that the military-backed regime is in there, Pakistan is helping create make munitions and uh, for the Ukrainians uh, and is otherwise, you know, uh, pliant, you know, towards U.S. interests as it relates to China, uh, India, you know, and Russia. And so we actually do have a rudder going there. Um, it just doesn't match our kind of rhetoric around belief in democracy and it's 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 really shocking to think about a country of that size like 250 million people which you know at times like had military dictatorships other times the democratic institutions pushed back through um had gdp growth significant gdp growth under under khan um now it's just an absolute economic basket case and they're, like I said, literally arresting down ballot candidates as they show up to file for office and not even charging them with anything. And Miller clearly in the State Department clearly feels zero pressure because he's like, well, who are we to dictate, you know, exactly how you run an election? You know, as long as you have an election, and like they would that would just never fly from any country that wasn't doing 100 percent of the other other bidding of the United States. Like they not not letting people on the ballot and and abducting them and not even charging them. Because one thing, if it's like all of these candidates happen to be you know criminals that showed up, but you're not even charging them with anything. It it, it really uh, maybe it's just a function of 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 our news and uh, having social media, but 
in my lifetime, I don't remember such a naked sort of like, we've got two books. And when we talk about this, we'll read from this book. Mm -hmm. When we talk about that, we'll read from this book. I mean, it really is like, you know, again, um, when it came to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we had the, um, uh, the, the war crimes assessment done within uh, three or four weeks. Uh, with Israel, right. it's going to take, it may take, who knows? It could take six months. Don't it could take nine judgment. months. Don't want to rush judgment. We don't, we don't have the resources to do this type of investigation. They can, they can have a top intelligence person leak without evidence that we know there was a command center with hostages right. there under a hospital, but we can't really make the assessment of the 2,000 bombs, the 200, 2,000-pound bombs that were dropped in the supposed safe zone. It, yeah. it, this is, it really is astonishing. It's getting Very bold. It's getting really dark, yeah. Well, Ryan, um, at least we got to see your tie. I knew it. Clip. I yes. knew it. I was waiting. I was one, waiting. Right? It's a big, thick one. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if uh, well, the tie that was wider. Paisley, so that's okay, right? That kind yeah. of paisley. I don't know if that's. I, like I mean, that's paisley. nice if you're going to a very fancy dinner, but <laughs> I don't know that that's one I would have worn there in that situation. I'm going back to the Jerry Garcia ties. If I'm going to get grief for it, I'm just going all the way back. Jerry Garcia ties will 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 at least like you come in there and be the Jerry Garcia type of uh, rep. But like you're wearing ties that like honestly you'd wear to a wedding. That is fancy, a wedding tie. Fancy wedding. Yeah. I don't, What's yeah. a Jerry Garcia tie? I've only seen him ever in like tie dye. I mean, oh, I don't... he had uh, he did the whole line he did of ties. The whole line of ties because he would do like artwork. I mean, he was a good artist. Huh. He was. Yeah. Yeah. Check him out. You'll like him. Okay. That's what it means to be a mighty man of valor. Yes, yes, that's what it means. <laughs> Ryan Grimm, uh, always a pleasure. Uh, your book, The Squad, AOC and the Hope of a Political Revolution, uh, is really interesting. There's a lot of sort of like um, uh, inside, um, it's not that inside baseball, but there's a lot of reporting to understand the dynamics that are going on. If you really want to understand the, sort of the constraints, uh, the limitations of of like the progressive uh, wing of, uh, of the party, um, your book, both these books, but particularly this next one in terms of like the interplay between, um, AOC and Pelosi and whatnot, really, uh, interesting. And we should say, well, thank you. It, it's, um, there's, there's, it, it gives you the groundwork to understand in some respects, like, you know, uh, Bernie came out, uh, two days ago, was it three days ago, mm, yeah. uh, saying no more aid to Israel. Warren came out and said it conditional aid to Israel. Um, I don't know how much of an impact this is going to have, but it, but it, but it very well may, um, influence things in the Senate. If this starts to, to roll yep. more, it's been interesting that the delay on this funding for Israel is, is working against them, mm -hmm. uh, in this instance. Yeah. Which is yeah. not to say that they're not getting emergency funding and they're not, they don't have an open door to uh, weaponry in Israel. But um, at the very least, from a political standpoint, maybe that permeates uh, the, the bubble in Israel. I don't know. Uh, Ryan Grimm, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. You got it. Thanks, Ryan.